In this video, we're going to do a project that I've been planning for quite some time. We're going to be building a dedicated Windows 7 gaming PC. Windows 7 is over 10 years old now, which means it's starting to get to the point where games and applications that were designed with Vista and 7 in mind don't always run so well on modern hardware with Windows 10. I already have dedicated gaming PCs running Windows 98 and Windows XP for the sake of legacy compatibility, and this build is designed to complement those ones, by bridging the gap between 2005 and 2013, or thereabout. I've seen more and more issues crop up over the past few years while trying to run games from this era on Windows 10, and I expect that problem to only get worse in the future. In fact, my timing with this project seems to be spot on, because Microsoft unveiled Windows 11 as I was working on this build. I guess that all means Windows 7 is officially retro now, which feels weird to say seeing as this OS came out when I was in high school, and I still have some of the original hardware that I used to run it back when it was current. Now my goal for this build is the same as with all my other retro computers. That being, I want to get some mid to high end hardware from around the tail end of when the OS in question was relevant, and then set it all up with a case and a display from around the beginning to the middle of that same period. That way I can get high compatibility with the best visuals and performance possible, while hopefully keeping an era appropriate look and feel to everything. Before we get into the build though, I just want to briefly go over some of the prep work that I had to do beforehand. Windows 7 was released well into the era of flat screens and high definition, so I wanted this build to have its own era-appropriate display instead of using the CRT I already have for my XP and 98 machines. Before starting this project, my retro PC corner really didn't have enough room to add another computer, much less a whole other display with its own mouse and keyboard. So my partner and I spent the better part of a week taking this room apart and putting together a custom desk just to accommodate this build. I didn't document most of that process, but trust me, it was a lot of work. As for the computer itself, it turns out that I already have most of the parts I want to use in this build, but most of them are currently in various computers in use around the house. So I went ahead and bought this tower from a seller on Craigslist to act as a replacement for my editing PC, which I talked about more in my last video. Then, the components from my old editing PC were moved into the computers I wanted to scavenge parts from for the Windows 7 build. I spent about a day and a half taking apart computers, swapping various components around, reinstalling operating systems, and all that business. When all was said and done, I was left with this machine to use as a base for my Windows 7 gaming PC. So let's take a look at what we've got. The case is a steel Antec Designs Tower from 2008. This thing is an absolute beast. It's all solid steel construction, so it weighs a ton, and the case has a magnetic front panel that pops open to reveal the drive bays and power buttons. I love the way this thing looks when it's all closed up, but I think I would have preferred having the power buttons on the outside of the door. It's kind of annoying having to open this whole thing up every time I want to turn it on. This also happens to be the largest standing tower I own, which is good because I'm using a full height ATX motherboard in here specifically a Gigabyte GA590FX. This board has an AM3 Plus socket, which is currently fitted with an AMD FX8350. These AMD pile driver CPUs are known for running hot, and this is one of the faster ones you could get. With 8 cores clocked at 4 GHz, this guy has some pretty hefty thermal output, hence the massive knock to a cooler. In terms of performance, this chip should be more than capable of handling everything I plan to throw at it, once it's paired up with a decent GPU. The system also has 28GB of RAM installed, because DDR3 is cheap, and I have a ton of it just lying around, so why not go overboard? So that's the machine we're starting out with, and now it's time for a few upgrades. First up is the sound card. For this, I'm going to be using a Creative Sound Blaster X5 Titanium. Now, I've had this specific sound card for a really long time, and this is a fantastic little card. It does EAX, surround sound, it has great dynamic range. I've had this thing in a bunch of different computers over the years, most recently in my main Windows 10 gaming PC, and I only stopped using it there because I upgraded to a receiver that can do HDMI audio. So yeah, this card is going to be excellent in this machine, especially with the speakers I have picked out for it, which I'll get into later. For now, it's time to move on to the video card, which I'm not nearly as excited about. 
I was originally aiming to get a mid-range GTX 6 or 7 series card for this build. I think something like a GTX 670 or 760 would offer a good balance of performance, efficiency, and compatibility for what I'm trying to build here. But unless you've been living under a rock for the past six months, you probably know that the GPU market is absolutely insane right now. The prices on everything, even older cards, are through the roof at the moment. And there's no way in hell I'm paying upwards of $80 for a nearly decade old card that was selling for half that just last year. I've decided to just wait until prices come back down, or I find a good deal, but in the meantime I still need a graphics card. Doubly so given that this motherboard has no onboard video output. That's where this thing comes in. It's an MSI GT730, and it's the best graphics card I have to hand that's not being used elsewhere at the moment. This card isn't great. In fact, it's not even technically a gaming card. This card is from 2013, and yet the GPU from 2008 I've got in my Windows XP computer beats it out in most of the benchmarks I've looked at. And yes, we're going to be running some performance tests on this system later in the video. With the graphics card installed, it's time for the final upgrade, which is a 256GB Samsung SSD. Unfortunately, I don't have a spare 2.5 to 3.5 inch bay adapter right now, so I'm going to just kind of let the drive sit in here for the time being until I get one. It's not ideal, but there's no moving parts here, so it should be okay. With the computer all put together, it's time to put it to one side for a little bit while I set up the display. This is an HP W2207, and it might just be my favorite part of this build. This display is from 2007, and it absolutely screams late 2000s to me. Everything about it feels like it was created specifically to complement the design language used in Windows Vista and 7. We had an HP display similar to this for the family computer when I was growing up, so that's part of the reason I wanted this model. But it also helps that this was a pretty good LCD for the time. It's got a resolution of 1680 by 1050 so not quite 1080p, but still plenty of resolution for the games I want to play. It also comes on a fully articulated stand that allows it to be rotated 90 degrees, which was not a standard feature at the time. The viewing angle does leave a bit to be desired, but overall I think this display has aged much better than a lot of others from around the same time. The colors on this thing just pop, much better than many newer displays I've used. And that's despite the fact that this panel apparently only has 6-bit color depth. I can kinda see the color limitations when I look real closely for them, but the picture overall looks so good that I never would have known it wasn't 8-bit if I hadn't read the spec sheet. With that all hooked up, it's time to go ahead and install Windows. First thing to do is double check the boot order in the BIOS settings. And before we move on, can I just say that I really don't like the BIOS interface on this motherboard? This is an early attempt at a mouse-driven BIOS interface, and it's bloated and ugly, and I've always hated using it. The layout is pretty conventional, but it's covered in these ugly icons and other graphical bloat. The mouse speed is so slow that the only effective way to navigate is with the keyboard, so I don't know why they even bother to include it. Even with a keyboard, it always feels like there's a slight delay to your inputs in this menu. Combined with the overly maximalist GUI, at low resolution, and a distorted aspect ratio, it just feels icky to use. Getting back to the setup, it's time to install Windows. Nothing too noteworthy here, just going through the Windows 7 setup, so I'll skip ahead a bit until after the install is finished and it's time to install drivers. I've still got the driver disk that came with this motherboard, so we're going to start with that. The interface on this installer is basically the same as the BIOS, it's bloated and ugly and overly maximalist, and of course it wants me to install Google Chrome and other garbage toolbars I don't need, but we still run through it here and it takes a while to install everything, and after a reboot we can get online. So now it's time to install Windows updates. Almost 2 gigabytes of them, which is like half the size of the base operating system. I assume this is downloading every Windows 7 update that's been released since Service Pack 1, so it's gonna be a while. While that's going on, I'll take the time to show off the peripherals I have picked out for this machine. For the mouse, I've got a Logitech G500 gaming mouse. I just had this lying around, I think I got it at a Goodwill or something a few years ago. It's era appropriate and works pretty good. The keyboard is a Red Dragon K552R, 
and it's the only part of this setup that isn't authentic to the era, which you can tell by the modern logo on the Windows key. I really don't mind though, because this was pretty cheap for a mechanical keyboard, and it has really good feeling tactile switches. I also took this opportunity to set up the speakers, and for these, I'm using a set of Logitech Z5500 digital multimedia speakers. These speakers are really, really good. Like, they're some of the best sounding desktop PC speakers you can get good. These speakers haven't been made in years, and a full set of them still fetches upwards of $200 on eBay, which is more than I've spent on this entire project so far. Audiophiles love these things, so I'm really glad I have a full set of them on hand. They're the perfect speakers for this build, and they're gonna sound great when paired up with the sound card that's in this machine. Alright, so the updates are all installed, and we've got direct video capture from the PC working. We've also jumped ahead a few weeks. There was a bit more initial setup that I wanted to show, but unfortunately the scaler box that goes between my old PCs and my capture card decided to randomly die at some point while I was setting this whole thing up. So I've had to order a new one, and I've gone ahead and done the rest of the setup and gotten some games installed on here while I was waiting for it to arrive. We're gonna go ahead and benchmark this machine in a minute, but first I want to take a look at the computer properties. As you can see, we're running Windows 7 Professional, and all our hardware appears to be correctly detected. The main thing I want to look at here, though, is the Windows Experience Index Rating. This is Microsoft's built-in performance assessment tool, and it's really not that good as far as system benchmarks go, but the results for this machine are kind of interesting. The best subscore on this list is Disk Transfer Rate, with the maximum possible rating of 7.9. Makes sense seeing as this benchmark wasn't really designed for use with SSDs. Memory and CPU speed aren't too far behind, each with scores of 7.8. The thing that I find really interesting is the score for graphical performance, which is at 6.7. While the GT730 is definitely the weakest component here, this score still puts it towards the top end of the scale. Based solely on the results of this assessment, I would expect this to be a pretty solid gaming PC for the era. So let's run some tests that mirror a real-world use case, and see if that assessment holds up. The first game we have to test with is Fear. This game features what was cutting-edge lighting and physics tech in 2005. It was considered fairly demanding, and a lot of PCs struggled to run it at the time. Considering this machine is targeting games released from about 2005 to 2013, Fear is actually on the easier side of what I want it to be able to run. It also has a really good built-in benchmarking tool, so that makes for a nice baseline test. Running through the demo level with max settings nets us an average frame rate of 24 FPS, with a low of 18 and a high of 26. I obviously didn't think this computer would be amazing with a GT730 in there, but I expected it to do a little bit better than this. We didn't even hit 30 FPS. It's also worth noting that V-Sync and Anti-Aliasing were both disabled for this test. Not by choice, but because I literally can't enable them while the display is being mirrored to my capture card. I've made sure the settings are enabled in-game, I've tried enabling them through the NVIDIA control panel, and I've even tried forcing V-Sync and triple buffering system-wide with Direct3D Overrider. Nothing works as long as this capture card is connected, but as soon as I unplug it and do a reboot, everything's fine. I did run another test without the capture card connected that had V-Sync and anti-aliasing enabled through the NVIDIA control panel. Unfortunately, I can't show you this test because I couldn't record it, but I actually got a higher average of 26 FPS. That's because the frame rate somehow got all the way up to 37 for one brief moment. The rest of the time, this test ran the same or worse as the first, as indicated by our new minimum frame rate of 14. So, not a super promising start, but maybe we'll do better on the next game I have lined up, which also includes its own benchmark tool, Far Cry 2. This game came out in 2008, and was one of that year's more demanding titles, due to its large open world with dynamic fire and wind effects. It's also the only game we're testing today that uses DirectX 10. We still have the issue of V-Sync not working with the capture card connected, but anti-aliasing does work when it's enabled through the NVIDIA control panel. For this game, I ran two tests, starting with a run-through of the medium-length ranch demo at max settings, which was pegged at right around 20 FPS for most of its runtime. 
The average frame rate here came out to 18 FPS due to a number of large dips later in the test, with the lowest being 8. Though we did hit a maximum frame rate of 32 FPS in the early indoor area. After that, I ran through the action scene demo, which didn't ever tank quite as hard with a minimum frame rate of 13 FPS, but it performed worse overall with a maximum frame rate of 21 FPS and an average of only 17. Now the last game on our list for today, Quake 4. This game released on the exact same day as Fear, but was built on the id Tech 4 engine, which was a couple years old at the time. Because of that, I expect this game to run better than anything else so far. But to my surprise, it ran far, far worse when I tested the first level at max settings. I'm talking frame rates in the low teens with constant dips into the single digits, textures not loading in all the way, and up to a couple seconds of input lag. This test ended when I died to the second group of basic grunts you encounter in the first level, because my inputs weren't being read fast enough. <laughs> I pretty quickly determined the culprit behind this abysmal performance. Quake 4's anti-aliasing not only works with my capture card plugged in, but it goes all the way up to 16 passes, which is what I had it set to. This system apparently really doesn't like anti-aliasing, because when I turned it off and tried again without changing any other settings, I got a somewhat consistent 60 FPS. The frame rate would dip into the 30s and 40s pretty frequently, and I'm still not sure all the textures were loading in properly, but this is at least playable which is what I expect of a moderately demanding game from 2005 on a system with these specs. Based on these tests, it's clear this machine is not even getting close to the kind of performance I'm hoping to get out of it. The bottleneck here is pretty obviously the graphics card, and I can say that with some authority, because this exact motherboard CPU combo is what I was using in my main gaming PC up until 2015. I've gotten way better visuals and performance out of newer games like Saints Row the Third, Spec Ops The Line, Crisis 2, and Bioshock Infinite on a rig that was basically identical to this one aside from having less RAM and a way better graphics card. And just for the sake of being thorough, I'm going to round this video off by running 3D Mark Vantage on this machine to get it a proper, era appropriate benchmark score to compare against when I eventually upgrade it. As expected, this machine absolutely chugs on every single 3D Mark test, though I think it might have done the worst on the physics test. The results at the end give us a score of 4,537, which puts it in the 19th percentile of all computers that have ever run this test. That's, uh, not very good, especially when you consider that this test predates both the CPU and graphics card that I'm using. I like how this results page shows other hypothetical builds as a point of reference. Based on this, I want to hit a level of performance that's at least on par with their 2013 Office PC. Which should be pretty easy, because this thing is using an AMD processor that's weaker than what I have in here, paired with a Radeon HD 7970M, which is beaten out by even the weakest GPU I had in mind for this build. Now the crypto bubble just needs to burst so I can actually get one without paying an arm and a leg for it. The last thing I want to touch on before I wrap this video up is Windows 7 itself. I'd forgotten just how good an OS this is. I haven't used 7 very much in the past 5 years, and when I have it's almost always been running on some crappy laptop that I'm trying to salvage for someone. It's been years since I've used 7 on a decent desktop and it just feels so nice. Everything is fast and stable and looks good. It's shiny and has smooth animations, and best of all, it's consistent in both its graphical design language and the structure of the OS. I think 7 is the best Windows has ever been in terms of user experience, and I'm not sure why Microsoft has struggled so much to make an OS that looks and behaves as consistently as this one in the years since. I hope Windows 11 will be up to this same standard when it comes to UX design, but I'm not holding my breath. In the meantime, you should give this video a like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, because I'm probably going to make an update video on this build whenever I'm able to actually upgrade it, and if you made it this far, I assume you won't want to miss that. But otherwise, I think that's all I've got for this one. Bye!